Hello again, welcome back to the lab. I hope you've watched the Taylor column demonstration where we saw um, the vertical rigidity of a rotating fluid on full display in the simplest case where we had a barotropic fluid with no density variations. We're gonna do another demonstration here. I have a different setup, as you can see, um, where I'm gonna relax that barotropic constraint. I'm gonna put some baroclinicity into the flu flow Baroclinicity means there's a density variations on pressure surfaces in, in, in the most general sense. The way we're going to do that here, and the reason I have a bucket sitting in the middle of the tank, is that we're going to introduce temperature gradients. So we're going to chill the center of the tank just using ice inside this metal can, which you can see right now is empty, save for this funny looking uh, lead pipe that's just holding it down so it doesn't float away at the moment. Um, so we're going to put ice in the middle and that's going to chill the water at the center of the tank and it's going to create radial temperature gradients along horizontal surfaces in the tank. And so the flow that develops as a result of that will um, <clears throat> be baroclinic and we're going to visualize in a few different ways the implications of that temperature gradient. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I've got over here, where is it now? Over here I've got ice inside this cooler. I'm just going to pick up the cooler, bring it over. I'll put it down on the floor here. And I'm going to just take some handfuls of ice cubes and I'm going to gently, trying not to disturb things too much, place them inside a can. Probably a more efficient way to do this, but that's all right. I'm trying to avoid jostling the table as I do this, so I'm trying to be mindful that my ice goes into the can and doesn't splash into the water. A few more. This is not the most exciting part of the video, but I want you to see the whole process so you can see that at least I'm being honest here. So ice is going in. A few more handfuls, and once I get enough ice in there, what I'm going to do is go over here and take this beaker full of cold water. It's too heavy for me to lift with one hand, so I'm going to pour some into a smaller beaker. I guess I can manage. Okay, so I got the big beaker of water, and I'm just going to gently pour cold water into the can where the ice cubes are just to make sure that we're making good thermal contact. I'll put that down. So back to the apparatus. So I've now got the ice, uh, sort of a cold water ice bath in the can at the center. And otherwise I'm not gonna disturb this. I'm gonna let it sit for, not sit, but spin steadily for a, a few minutes. And then we're gonna visualize what's going on in the water with a, a couple of things that should be familiar by now. So just to remind us, up here we've got the monitor that lets us see the image uh, from the co-rotating camera, um, which there's really nothing to see in at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to close this up and get it out of my way. And let's talk about visualization. So I have over here paper dots. You should be familiar if you just watched my Taylor column demo. I'm going to place those. Uh, I'm going to place a few on the surface. I'll go ahead and do that now. Just, uh, just put a few here and there. And now they're co-rotating in the tank. And if we go up to the um, image, we can see mm, there may be a little bit of relative motion. And so we're going to come back to that point in a moment. I have also my potassium permanganate crystals. And if you remember, these are the ones that um, leave a purple dye streak in the water uh, that kind of plunge down to the bottom of the tank as soon as we put them in. Now, I don't know if I can do this one-handed, but I'll try. Okay, I got a few crystals on the end of my little spatula here. Did I? Nope, oh, sorry, false alarm. I'm going to have to put the camera down for one moment. So excuse me, but I want to keep this live. 
So camera's down. I'm grabbing just a few crystals and I've got them in hand now. And here we go. I'm going to bloop, drop them in and there go those streaks. And so we can see in cross section, as we've seen before, they just plummeted straight to the bottom. We'll wait for it to come around again. Um, but we can already see something else going on. If we look in cross section, and it's not easy to see with the reflection, those streaks are not vertical, okay? They've been they're clearly getting distorted. And what I'm gonna do next is take dye. So I'm gonna take blue. Let's just be conventional. We'll use blue for the cold side. I'm gonna put blue dye here, a couple dots here next to where my ice bucket is. Okay, one more. The dye, of course, unlike the permanganate crystals, is mostly neutrally buoyant, so it doesn't plummet to the bottom. I'm gonna take red now, red dye, and I'm gonna put it on the outside. The warm side, right? Just a few dots, that's all we need. Now, what's going on? Well, I can already see that those blue pockets of dye have been very quickly um, sheared out into this sort of spiral pattern. Let's look in cross-section. Look at what's happening in cross-section near the uh, ice bucket. Look at those streaks of blue dye that are sort of wrapped up like a corkscrew already around that ice bucket. The red dye, it's not as obvious yet what it's doing but it's clearly not at least being sheared out quite as quickly. Let's go over to the rotating frame. There we can see these swirls. Okay, that, that blue dye, um, we can see pretty clearly in this image. We can see it actually, if you look, if we stay on this image for a while and look carefully, you can see the motion relative to the tank of that blue dye, it's moving, it's, it's rotating uh, uh, cyclonically around the um, center of the, that cold center of the tank. And in doing so, it's shearing itself out into this more and more elaborate spiral pattern. If I look back at the cross section, you can see, you have to stare at it for a while to see the detail, but you can see these spirals that have formed. So what's going on? I didn't, unlike the last experiment, I didn't change the rotation rate, I didn't agitate the tank or anything like that, but yet there's relative motion that has set up here in the tank um, sort of spontaneously as a result of putting the cold water at the center. So if we think about the thermal wind relation, that's the relevant bit of physics here, right? Thermal wind relation is, uh, pertains to flows that have a low Rossby number, so they're very close to geostrophic balance, and of course in hydrostatic balance, and the consequence we saw for a baroclinic circulation, uh, or in this case, a temperature gradient on, on horizontal or pressure surfaces, is that there will be shear in the vertical wind. And so more specifically, uh, in the tank here, since I have cold in the center of the tank and I have warm out on the edge of the tank, the direction of the shear is such that the horizontal, the azimuthal flow going around the tank has got to increase as I go from the bottom of the tank to the top. That's what the thermal wind relation says must happen in a flow like this tank. Let's go back to the screen. Look now at those beautiful circles that have emerged. Um, again, as we've seen in a, a number of different experiments, not really any evidence of mixing of different parcels of fluid, right? It's all streaks of blue and red. Then down at the bottom, it's not obvious that it's on the bottom in this image, but the purple, if I go down here, is in fact right sitting on the bottom of the tank. We've seen that before. That's the permanganate crystals that are now migrating outward. I can tell, I can see the blob where they hit the, the, the bottom originally, and the dye is slowly migrating out toward the center, uh, the outer edge of the tank. It's another consequence, as it turns out, of the rotation and in this case of a frictional interaction with the bottom of the tank, but that's a story for another day. Um, but 
what we've seen here is a pretty vivid uh, illustration of a thermal wind relation that says that the flow up at the top level of the tank near the surface has to be going a lot faster than the flow down near the bottom. And as a result, the bits of dye that started at the top of the tank got spun around quickly. The bits of dye below them got spun around more slowly. And as a result, we got these bits of dye being stretched out into a corkscrew as the ones at the top moved much faster than the ones at the bottom. And now after some time, the corkscrew has really turned into something more like a cone-shaped structure where there's so many individual filaments of blue and red that it's getting hard to sort of see them individually, but rather in cross-section, we can see a sort of cone-shaped structure that's evidence of, of this quite very symmetric circulation that exists strictly because of the uh, temperature gradient of course, this is only going to work in uh, a flow. I'll go back one more time to this co-rotating image. Isn't that lovely? Those streaks just round and round and round. This is only going to work for a low Rossby number. Okay, so um, the thermal wind relation does not apply if we don't have flow that's close to geostrophic balance. Um, and there's some other complications that we'll probably talk about another time. Um, where we might have, in a similar setup, a much more complicated flow pattern that is in thermal wind balance to a good approximation, but develops much more complicated um, undulations and waves and eddies as a result of instabilities that, might, that can develop in the tank. So one thing to note here is this is rotating, but it's rotating very slowly. If I go down to the meter, it's 2.5, 2.6 RPM. That's about the slowest rotation I can manage with this apparatus. And that was on purpose, because if I go much faster, I'm unlikely to see such a beautifully symmetric circulation. And in fact, that has analogies to the way that the rotation of the Earth constrains the flow in the Earth's tropics, where the relevant value of F is small, versus the mid-latitudes, where F is much larger. This is more analogous to the tropics, where the circulation to first order is very symmetric. And so this, in addition to visualizing the thermal wind relation, also turns out to be a visualization of something akin to Earth's Hadley cells. And that's where the migration of the purple dye out toward the outer edge of the tank fits into that analogy, because that is in fact um, analogous to uh, the behavior of, of the of the low-level winds near the Earth's surface, where they're uh, affected by friction with the Earth's surface. But we'll talk about that another time. For now, just admire this beautiful cone structure and think about the fact that if there's nothing else going on, the fact that there's a temperature gradient in a rotating flow means that there must be vertical shears in the horizontal wind. And so that rotation imposes a very strong constraint on the kinds of flows that we can observe and a very strict relationship between temperature gradients we measure in the horizontal and velocity gradients we can measure in the vertical. And so that's the manifestation of the vertical rigidity for a baroclinic flu fluid in its simplest form. And this is the generalization of the Taylor column result to the baroclinic fluid.